dark matter and dark energy. We know okay. it's there, mm -hmm. and, but it's a complete mystery. We don't understand the origin of 85% of all the gravity of the universe. It's not black holes, uh, comets, star planets. It's none of the above. So the math says there should be more there, but we can't see it. Right, so it's actually missing gravity rather than missing mass. I mean, oh. sorry, it's, it's, it's gravity with no known source. Which is, so what I I like to, I, Which is what I said. I, I like to think of it as dark ago. gravity. It's dark really, gravity? It's really dark gravity. Wow. That's really what it is. Then, then, there's some mysterious pressure in the vacuum of space. What do you mean? Which we call dark energy. But we should just call those Fred and Wilma. I, I joke about this, because we don't know what they are. So, wait, so don't give it a name that makes you think we know what it is, because we don't actually know what it is. But it's there. We measure it. A mysterious pressure in the vacuum of space that is forcing the universe to accelerate in its expansion. And I've written about this because I lose sleep over this fact. <laughs> okay, can I share this? I don't want, I don't want to be blamed. I doubt I could stop you. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't want to be blamed if Do you it. cannot get to sleep tonight. No, I'll, I'll be okay. Okay, all right. So this dark energy in the future will render the universe so large having accelerated so significantly that all the galaxies of the night sky will have accelerated beyond our horizon. What? And, and all the galaxies are the source of our knowledge of cosmology, of the Big Bang. Everything we know about the history of the universe comes to us from these galaxies. If they accelerate beyond our horizon, the next generation of cosmic explorers will only have the stars of the Milky Way to think about. And I... So... There, there's an, there would have been an entire chapter of the universe ripped from their view. And they will be trying to contemplate an understanding of the universe without a significant part of what its past was. And so I lose sleep wondering, today, was there some previous chapter ripped from the universe itself? And here we are. <laughs> and here we are, you know, Touching the elephant, try, not knowing that, in fact, there's an elephant standing there. Or maybe there's the shadow of the elephant and the elephant has been moved. We don't know what we don't know. And this leaves me awake at night. I lose sleep over that. So, Mike, tell us about stars that blow up. First, disentangle mm -hmm. the fact that the word nova and supernova mm -hmm. looks like one is just a sort of an extra version of the other, but they're two completely different things in the universe. They are completely different things, but there's not just novas or novae and supernovas. There are micronovas. There Ooh. are dwarf novas, Ooh. recurrent novas, okay. novas, supernovas, sub-supernovas, and hypernovas. And they're all... Now you sound like you're just making hey, shit up uh, right now. Yeah, <laughs> A physicist, Kardashev, no relation to Kim. <laughs> he wrote about levels of civilization by what means of energy do you command? And a level one civilization controls all the energy manifesting on your home planet. A level two would capture all the energy from its host star. And now you build a similar device that captures all the energy of all the stars in your galaxy. That'd be a level three. And a level four would be all the energy of all the galaxies of all the universe. And there's a level five, I think. Yeah, that's called God. You're God, okay. The total number of people who have ever been born, number's about 100 billion. Now ask, how many total possible people can be born? Just look at the genome and rearrange it. You know, it makes tall people, short people, you know dark-skinned people, light-skinned people, everybody in between. You can make all kinds of people with the human genome. How many total humans are possible? That number is astronomically large. It is large, 10 to the 30th power, which is a billion, trillion, trillion. It's likely even bigger than that. Ugh. Which means, in practical terms, no one who will ever be born will be identical to you, first of all, in every way. But that's, that's not the most important fact. It's that we're the lucky ones. A point made by Richard Dawkins, more poetically than I can recite here. We're the lucky ones. We're the ones who get to die because 
you only get to die for having lived. Most people who could ever exist will never even be born. So no matter what your lot is in life, if you are, have a disease or you have cancer, you're crippled, whatever is the thing, at the end of the day, you're alive, not dead, nor not having ever been born. So take every occasion you can to smell the flowers, to drink in the sunsets and the sunrise and the, and the, the majestic sky above you that they cradle through the nighttime hours and celebrate life because you won the lottery and most people will never even know there was a lottery. If that's not motivation to live life to the fullest and not fear death, because I'd rather die than never having been born, uh, I don't know what is. I'm so impressed by this. Are you ready? Somebody's diagnosed with terminal cancer. The doctor says, you got six months to live. You say, you mind if I get a second opinion? Of course, go ahead. Go to a second doctor. You got five months to live. Go to a third doctor. Seven months to live. So basically, you're gonna be dead in six months, plus or minus, okay? What happens? You're alive a year later, okay? You're alive two years later. Three years later, the cancer's in remission. Five years later, it's gone from your body. You happen to have been a religious person, and all over that time you were praying. People were praying for you. Here's what's astonishing, is that if you are that person, you are more likely to believe that God cured you, this invisible force, creator of the universe, cured you than that you had three idiot doctors diagnose you. <laughs> I am astonished by this fact. The American Medical Association, is that what they call it, AMA? Has got to be the most powerful organization in the world because no one questions those diagnoses. They'll credit whatever else was going on because they were sure they were gonna die. And I can tell you this, I taught physics to pre-med students who became doctors. Not all of them are smart, I assure you. Not only that, they're all trained in the same system. So three separate doctors that all went through the same system of medical schools, that's not actually three different opinions. It's the same opinion, just nuanced by the, what the person had for breakfast that morning. It's not three different opinions. Just so you know, vegetables are bitter. And the question is, how come kids don't like vegetables but adults do? And the answer is, most plant matter that would kill you in the wild has a bitter taste. And so if you are a child and happen to like bitter tastes, you're dead, okay? <laughs> so, so uh, or, more specifically, you don't live long enough to have other children who like bitter taste. So, and, and children are much more susceptible to the same quantity of toxins than what an adult would be. So it's not unrealistic to recognize that children have a higher sensitivity to bitter taste because they have a higher susceptibility to the death of bitter plants. And so what it means is if any kids in the room who don't eat their broccoli, you have genetic arguments to lodge with your parents. <laughs> Black holes are not giant sucking machines. Right. They just have a gravitational field. Gotcha. If you get really, really close, kiss your ass goodbye. Right. If you're not, you'll just maintain an orbit around it. Like we do the sun. Like we do the sun. Exactly as right. we do the sun. Right. We don't, we don't crash into the sun. We don't the crash sun. into We're the sun. We're not getting sucked into right, the sun. Right, right. And so if you step back, it looks like all the planets are spiraling around, which they are. Right. But they're not getting sucked into the sun. Right. All right. So the toilet bowl effect. Mm-hmm. That swirl. These are called spiral arms, and our understanding of them came of age while I was in graduate school. Because how do you maintain that? And because the inner parts of the galaxy actually will complete an orbit faster than, than the, the outer, outer parts. parts. So you get this stretching of these coherent 
cloud formations that because the galaxy rotates, as we say, differentially, mm -hmm. which means the inner parts rotate faster, faster than the, the outer, outer, parts. outer parts, it will drag it into the spiral shape. Right. And one of our big challenges was, how does it maintain the grand design two-arm spiral without over time just winding up on itself? Right. Okay, so that's where it got complicated, and we had to worry about what's called spiral density waves. It's not really a physical gaseous structure. The gas is everywhere. There's a density wave that's moving across the clouds, triggering star formation. Wow. So wherever this density wave is, there's star formation in that shape. So it's more complicated than it looks, but all I'm saying is everything is just simply orbiting the center of the galaxy. Right. And it's not like a toilet bowl that's ultimately gonna go down the tube. Right. If one was able to stop time, is it true that you wouldn't be able to see anything because the photons would freeze too? Can we make an exception to that? You know, mm. I, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. No. Because to the photon, there is no time. Mm. You might have heard that the faster you go, the slower time ticks. This is relativity. And in the limit, at the speed of light, time stops. Yeah. Photons, which exist at the speed of light, when they are emitted at whatever, wherever they came from, my PhD thesis was on the center of the galaxy, mm -hmm. which is 30,000 light years away. And when I captured those photons, for me watching them, they took 30,000 years. But if you're the photon, the instant you left the center of the galaxy, you hit my detector you're right there in the same instant. Yeah. So if there's zero time, I don't know what effect that would have on the photons. Right. Because they don't ever have time. Yeah, they, they're so outside I'm, of time. Out, out, in a way, they're outside of time. 21st century America, 80% of all the buildings have panels that look like this. There is no 13th floor. Not only was that true in 80% of the buildings in New York, it's true of this hotel. So what does it say for our future when we have people afraid of a number? What does that mean? I don't know, but it scares the hell out of me. Not only that, we fear negative numbers. Why do you have to go into an elevator of a tall building and it's uh, 554 lobby, S, S, B, S, S, B, three. I don't, I, I, can I buy a vowel, please? I don't know what the hell these things are. <laughs> They're afraid to go negative. Just say negative one, negative two, negative three. People are afraid to do that. They're afraid to do that on financial ledgers. The, ne they, like, the number is in parentheses. It's like, What's your problem? We got, a, we, we got a symbol for this. It's called negative. How much do you weigh in water? I don't I'm, I'm Zero. Nothing. You're yeah. neutrally buoyant. So in water, we don't weigh anything. Put a scale in water and stand on it and read it. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Okay. okay. So when you don't weigh anything, then structurally, you're not putting yourself at risk. And that's why the largest creature there ever was is a mammal and it lives in the ocean. Right. It's a whale. Right. The blue whale. Right. So when they say, how much does a whale weigh? Right. The answer is zero. They give you a weight, and how do they give you a weight? They take it out of the water, right. put it on a scale on the on dry land. Right. And then it weighs you know, a gazillion tons, but that's not the weight that the whale feels as it moves through the ocean. I, I, don't, I can't speak for cat owners, but those who own dogs, you know oh. that every time you come back from wherever you went, the dog is happy and it's jumpy and it wants to lick you in the face. Even if you just went to get mail from the mailbox, yeah, they delight in your return. If you want to take them out for a car ride, they are the first in the car. <laughs> they jump in, they don't care where it's going, but they're going somewhere. Yeah. They're some of the most joyous creatures that live among us. And no, I'm not a dog psychologist. <laughs> But let me offer a possible, a plausible account of this. Okay. Uh, dogs don't live as long as we do. An old dog is like 14 and then they die. We live to 90 if we're, you know, eat well and wear a seatbelt. You divide the two, you get a, basically a factor of seven. Okay. Yeah. So this is the, where the seven dog years formula comes from. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so if a dog is three or they're 21 in dog years, this is what we say. How authentic is that, you can ask? It's a convenience, but is there any deeper meaning to it? And I think there is. Okay. It means every single day a dog lives is equivalent to a week 
of your life. Oh wow, that's a seven to one ratio. <laughs> Poor yeah. handsome. So if they <laughs> if 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 they only get one day for every week you're alive, they make every day count. Now of course they're not doing I'm the gonna, math. I gotta, I gotta right take now. my dog for a walk. <laughs> Here on Earth we have a magnetic field. Not very strong, but we have one. And when dangerous charged particles come from the sun, we call it the solar wind, mm -hmm. they see Earth's magnetic field and then they channel themselves away and funnel in at the poles. And they collide with our atmosphere and render it a glow, wow. causing the aurora. Mm -hmm. So when we see the aurora, that's the atmosphere and our magnetic field shielding us from harmful radiation. 